There are no good jobs. The employers have been getting over on people for decades. Let's have a conversation. As you may or may not know, depending on when you came in here and what videos you've seen, uh, I used to be a regular person. And I used to work regular jobs. I used to be in a situation where my skill sets only allowed me to work normal, regular, low pay, low wage jobs. And I honestly did not feel that it was um, my employer's duty to give me a certain kind of job. I, I didn't feel that. I'm, I'm from a different generation. Um, one of the things that I used to do was look at, I needed money, so I needed a job. And this is before I learned how to um, create value. This is before I learned how to build businesses. And one of the things that I consistently ran into and I frequently discovered that you're gonna be paid less than what you're worth. That's the game. And the game has been in play for two, 3,000 years. The owners, let's talk about the owners. There's many people who feel that the owners have gotten over, the owners should give the employees more money. And I, I had this comment, this pandemic made people realize that there was more to life than working a low wage job. I'm going to say, yeah, there is more to life than working a low wage job, but here, here's how it used to be. You know, when I was coming up, you know who you see working the low wage jobs? Young people. When I was a kid, I never saw anyone over the age of 20 something working at McDonald's, Captain D's, Shoney's. I never saw old waitresses. I never saw old fast food uh, service attendees. I never saw that. It was young people. And you wanna know why? These are temporary jobs. It was never in designed for you to work at McDonald's at the front counter for the next 40 years. That's not the game. The game is progression. So one of the things, since I used to be an average person working minimum low wage jobs, I learned that you had to create value to get out of that. Like, once again, I don't feel that, like, there's a Roma, there's a McDonald's, there's a service station there. I don't feel that it is McDonald's purview to provide you a living wage. The job pays what the job pays. The burden isn't on the employer. The burden is on you because I, I hire people, um, essentially. And this is a conversation I recently had. I was told that I was paying my employees too much. Oh man, you get someone to do that for 12 bucks an hour. So, you know, getting someone to work and do certain things is very much a challenge. Really, 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 really a challenge. But the burden is upon you to raise your skill sets so you can compete for a higher wage. The burden isn't on the employer, like Waffle House, um, what is, what else is up here? Waffle House, there's, I don't even know what that is. Taco Mac, Chick-fil-A. The burden isn't on these employers to turn jobs that a monkey can do. I'm not trying to be dismissive, but how much effort does it take? Hello, sir. What's your order? Do, do, do. 
that's, that's not rocket science. That's a low wage job. That will always be a low wage job. And you got people who want to turn low wage jobs into high wage jobs because they don't want to take upon themselves the burden of self improvement. And I'm, I'm, I need to mention this. I was homeless. And uh, most of you guys are not homeless, which means you're starting off at a much higher level than I did. You're starting off at a higher level. So here's the thing. And, you know, a lot of people push back like, folks, you're not lazy. Really? Let's go ahead and examine. I, I need to find this article that talked about what people were, were doing. Now, these were people who were employed. And when the pandemic first started, they were working from home. And you know what they were doing? They were doing drugs, smoking weed, having sex, playing video, video games when they were supposed to be working. These were folks who had a job. And this is what people were doing. This is what people were doing. So yeah, like, oh man, people are, you know, I feel that the folks who are offended that I would use the L word, lazy, are the primary people that I that I apply this to. Because if I'm saying, if you're a person who's not lazy, you got two, three jobs, and I say, well, a lot of these people are lazy, and you're like, they don't apply to me, you're not gonna be mad. You're not gonna be mad. You're not gonna be dipping your feelings. But if I say that and you get mad, more than likely, you're one of the lazy mofos. And it hurts because you're being called out. A lot of people, they're, they're, like I said, there's a group of people who are hardworking, have two, three jobs, doing everything they need to do to make their way, pay their own way, make money. I'm not talking about that group. And those people who are working two or three jobs, and they hear this message, they're like, yeah, a lot of people are lazy. They're not offended or insulted. But for those of you who get offended or insulted, I'm talking to you and you know it. And you know it because here's the game. There's always going to be an upper class. There's always going to be a group of people who have money when most people don't have money. That's how the system is set up. There's going to be somebody who... The rest of the world can be going hungry. They can be eating out of trash cans. And these people will have millions of dollars. These people will be able to do what they want, buy what they want, take vacations, eat fancy dinners. I don't care what the rest of the world's going through. Let's call this the top 10%. The top 10% is always going to have money. And there's the top 10%. And then there's the top 1%. And there's the top 0.5%. Now the top 5.5% 5 5 are the billionaires. They're not part of, they're not part of the 1%. They're part of the 0.5%. These folks have so much money that they can do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. And essentially some of these people are setting up their own armies. They have their own private armies. That's how rich they are. So the 0.5%, they will do what they want. The point, uh, the 1%, I'm in the 1%. 1%, net worth of seven figures. 1%, net worth of maybe eight figures. I don't know. I don't spend a lot of time evaluating my net worth. I spend my time trying to create more revenue streams so I can make more money. I don't sit around going, oh, I'm a millionaire. I, I'm not doing that Graham Stephan things like millionaire reacts. That's very self-indulgent and it's a little bit, it's, it's kind of showing off a little bit, but for some reason he doesn't get that because I figured it out. He looks like a child. He looks like a little kid. He's very benign. He's not offensive. Where me, being six foot one, a bigger guy, more aggressive, authoritative, that, that fucks with people. That, that really messes with people. But he's very harmless. He's extremely short. And that actually plays into his favor because that's why he doesn't get the hate that if he was taller, if he was better looking, 
if he was more aggressive, he would get. So his small stature helps him in this game. But once again, going back to the conversation, it is not the employer's duty to provide you a living wage. It's not. There are many jobs out there that need to be done that's so simple. Once again, I'm not being dismissive, but a monkey, a monkey can do this job. It's like push this button, pass the people to train. That's not a high wage job. You know what is a high wage job? Let me tell you what's a high wage job. Selling commercial office furniture on commission. What do you have to do? You have to find the customer. Then you have to contact the customer. Then you have to set an appointment. Then you have to show them the furniture. Then you have to draw up a print. Then you have to manage the project. And then you have to convince someone that has never met you to give you a check for 50, 250, maybe half a million. In some cases, maybe a million dollars. That's a high wage skill. But you're doing multiple things. You're finding projects, you're managing pot projects, you're creating projects, you're creating re what revenue streams. That's a high wage skill. That's high wage. And once again, why aren't people in STEM? Let's talk about STEM. There is a lot to talk about. There are numerous STEM jobs that are unfilled because they don't have people who are qualified for them. If you can do internet security, cybersecurity, and you, you, you got a few certifications, there's literally hundreds of six-figure jobs for you. Let's talk about this, and let's go back to the lazy. Our tech industry is upheld by the HB1 visa. We're importing qualified talent to do these jobs because we don't have it on the homegrown front. Let me say that again. Many of the tech industry is propped up by the HB1 visa program because we don't have enough homegrown talent to do these jobs. People don't want to go to college and take math and science they don't want to do it they don't want to do it so we have all of these stem jobs that are not that that don't have they're not occupied because we don't have qualified people so let's go ahead and have a conversation like this is it money is it a lack of money or is it a lack of qualification it's a lack of qualification Go to Indeed, look up cybersecurity, look up all these STEM techie jobs, and there, there are tons of them that are going unfilled because we don't have enough people who are going to college to get the training to do these jobs. Why is that? Because it's hard. It's hard. Some of these uh, degree in science programs, I have a friend who went to Georgia Tech and he got a dual degree, a double E, which is electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And he had like a 2.9 and he said, man, they think I'm God with my 2.9. And he graduated Georgia Tech and rolled right into a six figure job in the nineties. In the nineties, six figure job in the nineties. But he, he went ahead and got that STEM degree. So it isn't that there aren't enough high paying jobs. That's not the problem. The problem is people don't want to prepare and qualify themselves for these high paying jobs. So essentially the noise is we want to turn all of these simple easy to do jobs into high paying jobs because that's what I'm qualified for. Once again, the onus isn't on the employer to create a high paying job for you to do something simple. That's not the game. And once again, in my video, 
20 million people in the danger zone, there are a lot of people who would rather sit at home and collect a check than go out and work. There are a lot of people who, will, who, who are in that spot. There are many, many people who are, who are there who would rather collect a check than to work. There's a number of people who are lazy. And if when I say lazy and you get offended, you're living in a delusional world if you think everyone is working as hard as they can, because most people aren't working as hard as they can. You think everyone is trying hard as they can, simply not true. You're living in a fantasy world if you think that all these people out here are actually trying their best. You wanna know how I know this? I am an employer. I've hired a lot of people and I've hired people to do a job and you know what? Everybody wants to get paid, but no one wants to work. You know how many people I had to fire? Here's a story. I had a girl, hired her as a writer. And, um, you know, she had a problem coming to work on time. And, you know, this was when I was working out of my home office and I had an office. So it was kind of known that I didn't come in every day. So I called this girl and I'm in the office and I'm like, hey, what are you working on? Are you in the office? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, that's kind of funny because I'm sitting in your chair at the office and you're not here. Blatantly lied to me about being at work. She was off doing whatever she wanted to do. Blatantly lied to me. And this was a $25 an hour job. So don't be giving me this stuff that people are, aren't lazy, man. People are lazy, man. They're doing the, no. This chick had a $25 an hour job, which is, if you could do math real quick, it's $50,000 a year, and she didn't even show up. I've hired people. I remember in the storage auction days, I hired this guy, and his first day of work, he called in. His first day of work. And I heard him whispering to this girl who answered his phone and he was like, <coughs> tell him I'm sick. They were laying in bed doing the nasty. He didn't want to come to work. He wanted to be paid, but he didn't want to come to work. So frequently, I see this behavior. So don't be giving me this, well, people are doing their best. No, they're not. I have story after story of hiring people who have not, who would not come to work, who would not do their job, who would goof off, who would play around when they had a job. And then there's a group of people who don't want a job. There's a group of people who um, are not interested in working. They're not interested in growing. They're not interested in building. They want to be subsidized. They want to be housewives. We have men and women out here who want to be housewives who have a husband, either a real husband or daddy government as the husband to go out and work and bring home a check while they sit around and do whatever they want to do. You know, y'all guys are funny, but if you're offended when I say people are lazy, People don't want to do what they need to do. People, if you get offended, more than likely I'm talking about you. Because a hardworking, enterprising person who's out here killing dragons, trying to make some money, trying to build a life, they're not offended when I say people are lazy. And I, I've been called <clears throat> out of touch because the average man is out here trying to do the best that they can. Bullshit! I've hired the average man. I've hired the average woman. Erica talked about all of the problems she had with truckers. All of the problems she had. And, you know, these guys weren't making minimum wage. They weren't making minimum wage. And she said that was one of the biggest problems she had dealing with these masculine, disrespectful personalities. And years ago, I knew a guy who had a trucking company 
And this was before now. This was when the climate was better. And he used to talk about the problems he had with his truckers. Truckers are like nomads. They'll go from company to company. You know, if this company pays 50 cent a mile, this company pays 60 cent, they will jump to this company for 60 cent a mile. No loyalty, nothing. And once again, if you think it is a company's job to take care of you, you are in trouble. You are in a lot of trouble. You are in um, a great deal of trouble because you don't understand the game. He who has the gold makes the rules. Let me say that again. He who has the gold makes the rules. Not the person who don't have no gold. So if you're a boss and you're employing people, you make the rules. If you're a worker, you don't make the rules. You have to follow the rules. So you got a choice, boss up or be a worker. And once again, tech, tech jobs. They, they have all these perks. They have all of these um, privileges. They have high pay. And a lot of these tech jobs go unfulfilled because people don't want to qualify themselves because it's hard. It's hard to get into tech. You got to take certifications. You got to you got to do some things. You got to use your you got to use your mind. In tech, you're going to work with your mind. In tech, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff mentally. You're going to be mentally whipped. You're going to like these coders. A lot of these coders are talking about how hard coding is because you have to sit down and mentally apply yourself over and over and over and over and over. Like, um, there's a special coding keyboard. There, there's so many little things because anything worth having is not going to be simple. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something that you can roll into and learn how to do in a day or so. Many of the best paying jobs take years to learn. Like, I was just sitting there like, why are you sit? What are you waiting on? And you got a tail light out. Uh, many of the best paying jobs take years to learn. Like, let's go ahead and talk about my recent endeavor with the car rental business. I got a lot to learn. I had no expectations that I was going to roll into this car rental business and make a lot of money from day one. I knew that wasn't going to happen. But as I learn how to do the rental business, as I learn how to build the rental business, as I qualify myself, as I learn certain things, like one of the things I learned, I'm getting rid of these player bait cars, the Range Rovers, the Porsche. Uh, I haven't done the, the final story on the Porsche, which is a trip. It's a crazy trip. But um, Porsche is gone. I'm getting rid of all these player bait cars because it brings me the wrong kind of customer. It brings me someone who wants to stunt, who wants to flex, but they don't have no money. They have no money. None. And essentially, it brings me the wrong kind of personalities. Uh, I'm amazed that I've had, I think this guy lost a key for the Range Rover. There's Range Rover that have two renters who have lost keys. Those are seven hundred dollar keys, and um, you know he says if he lost it, he he will replace it. And I'm like, I'm here to tell you, it's seven hundred bucks. So um, I haven't heard from him, <laughs> but once again, that's the that's the car rental business. These headaches are never going to disappear. See, th this is the thing you've got to understand about making money. Like I don't really talk about it, but I have headaches with selling online courses. I mean, it's just, that's how it is. I don't even talk about it. I don't even really think about it. It's like when it happens, it's like, this is what happens when you sell online courses. I'm not freaking out. I'm not talking about it. 
but selling online courses has its share of headaches, has its problems. Like, I'll, I'll share one problem with you. YouTube. YouTube is how I sell my online courses, right? And YouTube is notoriously finicky. I am not one of the chosen people. So I can just go ahead and say, if my channel blew up and I got a million hits, my online course income would 10X. So that's how I sell my courses through YouTube. And YouTube is hella problematic, problematic. Like Erica, Erica puts out a lot of good advice, a lot of helpful information and YouTube has stunned her channel, as she calls it, Skynet. Erica should be having way more views, way more subscribers, but because Erica be telling the truth, she don't get the views. She should be getting way more views than she should. But once again, as she calls it, Skynet has limited her. Now, if Erica got on there and was doing like a cat deal, or a Noel Randall, like you can do it. It's so easy, it's so great. And she pushed it like that and she left out pertinent details, she would get more views. So that's one of the problems of selling online courses with YouTube. Uh, another issue I have is people will sign up for a course, and this is a big problem, and they won't even ask for a refund. They, they'll sign for a course and look how much work has to be done and then they won't do it. They will not do it. They will just opt out. Never ask for a refund. They're just like, ah, this is too much work and they won't do it. That's another issue with online courses. There's a lot of little issues with online courses, but I've been doing it so long, I'm just used to it. I'm like, yeah, that happened. And that's one of the things that you, 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 you gotta stop looking for comfortable situations. Uh, when I first started selling online courses, I was very, very uncomfortable. I mean, I remember my first foray, I was using something called Vidcaster to host my videos, and I had this website that I had strung together, Then I was getting paid through to check out, and it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. And I just kept at it. And that was a very ugly, ugly phase with YouTube. Like when I first started YouTube, oh my God. It was, it took me like eight to 12 hours to put up one video. First I would shoot the video. Then I had this Toshiba satellite that would like ping, and it would shut off. And I would have to wait till it cool off to start processing the video again. Then I once I processed the video because YouTube didn't have the bandwidth that it has now, then I would have to use handbrake to crank down the video. I mean, I almost quit YouTube. That's how much hassles YouTube was. I almost quit YouTube. YouTube is way easier today than it used to be. Like, way easier. And I, I, I had um, a hate club, not a fan club, a hate club. People used to do these two and three hour hangouts talking about me and stuff. And I'm like, I actually had had a point where I got so fed up was so frustrated that I sat down and I did the Ben Franklin um, thing for solving problems. What you do is you draw a T-graph on a sheet of paper and you write pros and cons. And I was writing the pros, money, fame, helping people, and the cons, haters. Haters was my only con. I almost quit YouTube because of haters. And that was the only con that I had. And I was like, okay, that's the only con. We're gonna keep going on. And here it is, 12 years later, we're still doing YouTube, still making money. And the, the whole thing is, in this whole message is, stop looking for easy solutions. The money isn't in easy solutions. The money is in hard things. Increasing your skill sets. The money in, is in increasing your skill sets. The money is in doing hard things. The money is in solving problems. The money is in doing things that require effort. That's where the money is. The money is not in simple stuff. And that's where a lot of people are looking for money in simple stuff, i.e., hey, I flip burgers. I, I'm like, hello, my name's Ann. What's your order? Thank you. 
they'll be ready in the moment and then slide a tray of food. And people won't be paid 25 bucks an hour for doing that. The economics of that don't work. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen for all you people who hate these low-wage jobs, who feel that you should be paid more money for doing simple things, they're going to disappear. Like, McDonald's is already moving toward this. McDonald's, there's a McDonald's around the way. You go in there, there are two kiosks. The kiosk, you punch in your order, they take your payment, and then someone slides your food to custom tray. It's going to get to the point where you're going to walk into a McDonald's and you're not going to see anybody. You're going to go to the kiosk, you're going to key in your order, and then a slot is going to slide out with your food on it. There's going to be a there's going to be a slot, and your food's going to slide out that slot. You will not see anyone that working in McDonald's. They'll be behind the wall. Essentially, the McDonald only people McDonald's is going to be hiring in the future are cooks and people to prepare the food. There will not be anyone at the uh, counter to take your order. That's about to disappear. So for all of you who hate these low wage jobs, and it's just a matter of time before the majority of them disappear. You will not be able to get a low wage job because once again, society changes. Society changes. Employers are seeing, oh, you don't want to work? Okay, fine, we're gonna automate this. It's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. So for all you who hate these low wage jobs, you're gonna be crying in the future because they're not going to exist. You're not gonna have anything that you can do. And it's gonna be really, really tough. It's gonna be really, really tough. So once again, it is not the employer's job to give you a job that pays you a lot of money. It is your job to qualify yourself to get a job that makes you a lot of money. That is on you. And once again, I am an employer. I've hired literally in my career probably 200 people. And I've had some really good employees. And I've had some employees that absolutely sucked. Sucked. Wouldn't want to come to work. You know how many people I fired within the first week? I probably fired like 50 people in the first week. 50. So all employees are not created equal. Once again, there's some good people out there. You hire them, you pay them, you treat them right. They will, they will work their ass off for you. And there's a group of people, I don't care what you pay them. I don't care how good you treat them. They're not gonna, they're not gonna do right. They're just not gonna do right. I don't care. They're just not gonna do right. So that's all I got for you guys. Um, there's some new training coming up in July corporate papers let me go ahead and get that set up and i'm going to start doing credit repair and some other things not just credit repair because that's a lot of people just repair your credit but they don't educate you on how to play the credit game properly so we're going to do that so be looking out for that so that's all i got for you guys oh also if you're in the art of holding you'll get this new training if you're in the corporate toolbox you'll get this new training there's no need to buy anything and um, I will go ahead and set the pricing up and stuff around the 1st of July and get that out there. So that's all I got for you guys. I will see you in the next one.